If you have your Bibles, I want us to turn to the book of Romans, the 12th chapter, and look at one little verse here. And thinking of this verse, I was thinking again of Brother Helm. So many times people get upset with him and his message. But I think all we have to do is to look at the Christian world today and find out that Christianity, uh, as we see it, certainly is not getting the job done. That's no criticism of anybody. It's just simply facing facts. That there's something terribly missing in the Christian realm. And I'm praying that God will help us, that we will not miss it. I want to read this one little verse, Romans 12, 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, the New International Version says, which is your spiritual worship. The Amplified Translation puts the two together and says, your reasonable service is an act of worship. I like the two together. I don't think either one separately tells it all, but I think that the two together should be together. That every act of service in the will of God is an act of worship. So everything that God asks you to do, if it's done under the direction of Jesus, is an act of worship. Now, I want you to notice here, he says, I beseech you, brethren, and that is a strong word. He's saying, I beg you. Brethren, now notice he's talking to, he's talking to Christians, he's not talking to sinners. He said, I, and it's so important that he's begging them. Listen to me. I'm begging you. Not, not to the sinner, not to the man out in the tavern, not to the man who's sinning, not to the man who's fallen short, not to the one who's done something wrong, but he's, he's talking to Christians. He said, I'm begging you to present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service and act of worship. And the therefore, the scholars tell us, therefore refers to all of the 11 chapters before this of all that God's done for us, seeing that all he's done for us, and by his mercies, I'm begging you now, in light of everything he's done, has he done anything for you? Yes. Then he said, I'm begging you, uh, to present your body a living sacrifice. In other words, he wants us to get salvation not only in the spirit, but he wants it to get down into our bodies. He wants salvation is not just to get us to heaven, but it is to get it is to get the to get salvation down into the physical living and our bodies where we're living. It's to get salvation into our everyday life. Some people rejoice in the fact, oh, God saved me. Someday I'm going to go to heaven. What about today? What about now? Are you going to wait till you get to heaven before you're going to rejoice over salvation? Do you know that some of the great people of the world have been turned away from Christianity because they could not find, they could not see it. Take Gandhi, for instance. Gandhi could not see Christianity in the Christians. I think he told E. Stanley Jones or someone, he said, I like your Christ, but I don't like your Christianity. There's something wrong in Christian people. I was reading here some time ago, you remember in the early days, uh, some years ago, Christianity tried to convert the world by force. And if men didn't convert, they would put them to death. 
Even if you didn't convert, if you didn't convert even to their religion, they put you to death. There are more wars probably over religion than anything else. I was reading of one man in those days when they were about to burn him to the stake, he would not become a Christian. And before he bur was burned to the stake, uh, they, he asked them, he said, will there be, they tried to get him converted. He said, will there be any Christians in heaven? And they said, yes. He said, then I don't want to go there. It's what he could see in the Christians. And this little verse is trying to get salvation down into our bodies, into our, our, our live, everyday living. I think of Lincoln, that great man I mentioned to him before. He'd never joined a church because he couldn't find one church anywhere in his day that he thought lived up to what the Bible standard taught. And he wouldn't join it. Look at some, uh, uh, in, in communism, it's early days, some of the leaders, I think it were, uh, Marx was taught Christianity and these things, but uh, he, he simply uh, could not find what he's looking for in Christianity. When God saved you, when God saved you, he meant not only to forgive you of your sins, but he meant to include your body. He meant for your body to get saved as well. I'm amazed how much God has to say about the flesh. And if we're not careful, we'll put spirit, uh, Christianity and salvation and everything all entirely in the spiritual realm. I want you to know it belongs into the physical. The, West, the Word of God says that Jesus, the Word, became flesh and dwelt among us. He became flesh and walked among us. What, so that we could see Christianity in the flesh? It had to be perfect Christianity in order to die on the cross. His dying on the cross would have meant nothing had it first not been displayed in the flesh. So without the first, without the first, without the foundation of these first uh, 11 chapters, I want you to know that this verse, this little verse right here, uh, is either meaningless or hopeless or mere words or it's just impossible. We can advance no further in our spiritual life, we can advance no further spiritually than we're hungry for. We do not advance spiritually. I want to say this slowly so you get it. We do not advance spiritually with knowledge. You can quote the Bible from beginning to end and know all doctrines and answer every question and it would not help you spiritually one iota. I remember hearing Dr. Tozer talk about one time about the new versions that come out. He said, I'm a, I'm a new version addict. He said, one comes out. He said, I go buy it. But he said, I know that it will not make me a better Christian. I don't care how many versions of the Bible you read and how many you have and how many translations can show you scriptures and you can understand them and know them. It will not make you spiritual. Now, it's wonderful to rejoice when we find something new in a version, but it won't help you spiritually. It won't take you anything beyond your hunger. We do not advance spiritually by knowledge. We can quote the Bible from beginning to end, but it will not help us spiritually. We advance spiritually by our hunger and our thirst. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. To the spiritually hungry, the, to the spiritually hunger, hungry. This verse is a delight. They see it as the answer to life's needs. To the person who is not spiritually hungry, this verse is unreasonable. If you're not hungry, and you're not thirsty. This verse is unreasonable. To present your body a living sacrifice to God is unreasonable unless you're spiritually hungry. 
To those who see this verse uh, as, as unreasonable, it's because they, they do not hunger and thirst after righteousness. They see some of these wonderful verses in the Bible and they say it's hopeless, you can't do it, you can't live it. It's because you're trying to carry the verse instead of letting the verse carry you. We have it entirely backwards. In the light of self-effort, this verse is impossible. When the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, what must I do to have eternal life? Jesus told him what to do. And it said he went away sorrowful. God gave him, the, Jesus gave him the answer. He should have been delighted over it. But he went away sorrowful. He should have received it joyfully. Salvation means good news. Now, many have received the good news from sin, but they have, not, have, have rejected the good news about everyday living. The good news about everyday living. The Bible has good news about every day that you live. It has good news about every situation you face. It has good news for every problem you face. It has good news for everything that you can face in life. The Bible has good news for you. There's good news about husband and wife relationship. There's good news there. There's good news about family relationships. There's good news about work relationships. There's good news about problems of life and strife and difficulties. I want you to know there's good news and it's not just salvation from sin. It's good news about your situation. And as Isaiah, the 58th chapter, or I mean the 61st chapters, that's the one I want to, well, I'm going to get to that one later. Paul wants to get the good news down into every area of our lives. He wants to get the good news into our tongues. <laughs> Come on now. That's good news. Oh yeah, good news that God saved me. Wonderful. Well, has he got the good news into your tongue yet? That's good news. That he, can, that he can tame an unruly tongue. He can tame a temper that gets out of control. He can contain everything that comes out of your mouth. Jesus Christ has good news for our tongues. But so many times we want to take the good news of salvation from sin and take us to heaven. I want to tell you how good, the good news of salvation is for our bodies in everyday living. I want us to turn back and look at Isaiah 61. Here Jesus talks about the good news, the first chapter, the first verse of Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach the good tidings, or the New International Verse says, to preach the good news unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them the beauty for ashes. This is good news. He wants to give beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Do you go around heavy? And I think one says despair. He, there's good news. He's trying to get the good news to you. If you're going around in despair, he's trying to bring you the good news. It's not just to save you, but to tell you that he wants to give you the garment of praise for it. And if you are going around all heavy and depressed and down in this area, I want to tell you, you haven't found the good news yet for that. But God has good news for you, not just to save you, but to give you a garment of praise instead of that. He wants you to exchange it for that. Don't carry it around with you. Somewhere you're missing the good news if you still carry it with you. Good news. To bind up the brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty to the captive. To open the prison doors to them that are bound. I want you to know there's a lot more prisons than just behind uh, uh, cement or stone walls and, and iron fences and gates and bars. 
There are a lot of people that are in prisons in their own homes. I want you to know that if you think you're in prison tonight, I want you to know there is good news for you. More than just to save you. But there is good news. So, to comfort all that mourn, to get out the oil of joy for mourning, a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness or despair. Look at the 103rd Psalm, that beautiful psalm. Oh, some of these are such marvelous psalms. Some of these, the Word of God is so marvelous to us, but so many times we do not get the blessing out of it. The 103rd Psalm. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. And forget not all His benefits. Why are we down? Have you forgotten? Forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all of our iniquities? Who healeth all of our diseases? Who redeems our life from destruction? Who crowns us with loving kindness and tender mercies? Who satisfies thy mouth with good? Even he satisfies your mouth. You've eaten today, and he deliberately satisfied your mouth with good things. Have you forgotten? You sat down to a good meal or ate something that was delightful. Have you forgotten that God made you that way? Put the taste into those strawberries and into that wonderful corn and veg. He put the taste there to satisfy your mouth. Have you forgotten? Why are we down? I think of dear Maurice Burquist. And his wonderful little book, Laurie's, uh, Evans' his father wrote that wonderful little book. I think it's The Miracle and Power of Bre Blessing, and I think I referred to this before, but I refer to it just again because it fits in so beautifully here. Uh, he tells of the time when he was in a meeting someplace, I don't remember the state, and a woman called him up one day and said, there's a woman here that's about to be taken to a mental institution. Can I bring her this service? He said, yes, you bring her. So when he came, he said she was an irritation to the service. She got up, she was restless. She moved sit one place, sit another. And finally, after the service was over, this lady brought her to Morris Burquist. And uh, she said to Morris, or to Maurice Burquist, she said, I am a sick woman. And Maurice Burquist said, well, can I pray for you? And she said, yes. So they went in, I think, into a room someplace. He prayed a little prayer. Now he said, I want you to pray. She said, I can't pray. He said, well, I'm going to pray for you, and you, I'm going to say the prayer, and you repeat it after me. So he started just simply quoting the 103rd Psalm, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is with him. He said she had a hard time getting it out, but finally she, she got it out. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities? who healeth all thy diseases. He'd say, now you used to it. Who healeth, who healeth all thy diseases. Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Say it, and so she would get it out. Who redeems your life from destruction. I believe everybody in here, well, sometime or other, God has redeemed your life from destruction in some way or other. I know I would have been dead. And I have an idea a number of you would have been dead had it not been for God's mercies that he's redeemed us from destruction. And with many of the things that we grumble and complain about, have we forgotten? So he went on with it, who redeemed thy life from destruction, who crowns thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies thy mouth with good think, my, oh my, oh my, what has God done for us? If we can get salvation down into the body, what will it do for us? Anyway, when he finished the prayer, he looked up and the woman was smiling. She said, you know, I feel better. She said, I believe God's healed me. And Morris Berkowitz, Maurice Berkowitz said, you know, he said, she never went to the mental institution. And from then on, she was a well woman. When the devil plagues us from all sides, have we forgotten what he's done for us? Do you know, dear ones, I, it's rather interesting. 
But God wants to get into these tongues of ours. He wants to get into my hands. He wants to get, he wants to get salvation down into my feet. He wants to get salvation in every part of my body. Why? So that life can be a delight. To how many times do we look at, do you know that self-denial is good news? Oh, there he goes preaching on it again. It's good news. Can't he ever get off that subject? It's good news. He's trying to get it to us. It is good news. If we can ever practice it, we'll get into the delightful side of Christianity. But how many of us live in that side where people cannot see? That's why Brother Elm is trying desperately to get us to the place of oneness where Christ can be everything. Then he will bring the Holy Ghost awakening that will convert men and women to Christ. We can't do it on our own. We've proved it through the centuries that we're failing in doing. Something is lacking somewhere. But when Christianity can get down into these bodies of ours, then Christ can work. He will do the work. He'll save the lost. You know... If God could really get us where he wanted, his life would become such a delight. I mean a delight. Do you know, I actually believe that God has quickened Brother Helm's taste buds. Do you know of anybody that enjoys a strawberry like he does? Do you ever hear him talk about eating a strawberry? Oh, it can almost make your mouth water just listening to how wonderful the delight. I really believe that God so quickened him and touched his taste buds that I believe he enjoys food far better than any person I know. Why? Salvation got into his tongue and his taste buds. You eat with him sometime. He enjoys food. Oh, something's delicious. Oh, taste that. If he takes you eating someplace, he'll try to get you to eat something. Oh, taste a little bit of this. Why? If it tasted to you like it does to him, you might jump out of your seat. But I don't think you can get that taste transferred. But uh, he wants you to, he'll usually want you to try something. Why? Salvation's gotten into his taste buds. What does that mean? It means that God wants things to even taste better to us. He satisfies our mouth with good things. It means that when I sit down at the table, he, God loves me so much, he wants me to be delighted with that food. He made me that way. He made our taste buds that way. And so I believe that Brother Helm is quickened in every area of his body far more than people know. I've been with him driving down the road, and I, he's a good driver. If you've ever driven with Brother Helm, you know he's a good driver. He can make fast. He can go down through Miami like anybody, like some young man. And you marvel how he does it. I couldn't even find my way through Miami, but he'll drive all through. But in driving out in the country or anything, he'll be driving down the road looking. he say, see that deer over there and this thing over here? And he would think, well, how in the world can he see that? He's driving down the road, and he sees things that I couldn't see with my eyes looking around. God's quickened him in every area of his body. Why? Salvation got into this body of ours. I beseech you, I beg you, said Paul, that you, that you will present your body. Let God, let God get into your body. This is what he's trying to say. And when God can get into these bodies of ours, we'll find that Christ will come in such a marvelous way to the world that sinners will be converted to God and there'll be the Holy Ghost awakenings that we want to come.